Hi folks, in this episode of the Physical Education Podcast, we're going to be talking about muscular tension, what it really means, what it really is, and some uncommon ways of dealing with it. So I'm going to be using a different format for these videos. Uh, I tend to ramble, I tend to go off on tangents. So what I've done this time, and what I'm going to be trying from now on, is I have a script. I have written out essentially an article on muscle tension, and I'm going to be reading it out to you with ad-libbed bits in between, which should keep me on track keep it concise and keep it to the point. So let's get straight into it. Let's talk about muscular tension. So see, if you've been in pain for a while, you've probably been concerned about muscle tension and how to resolve it. So there's tons and tons of videos on YouTube and online on Instagram and all that sort of stuff. And they'll tell you what to do about muscular tension. They'll show you stretches, foam rolling routines, all this sort of stuff, even remedies, you know, supplements you can take for muscular tension but not many really address the why of muscle tension you know, why are these muscles tense in the first place and why won't they relax in spite of all of our efforts why can't we create relaxation in our muscles that should be kind of straightforward why, why can't we do that and so if we want to take meaningful or make meaningful progress we need to understand the purpose of muscular tension first and I believe we, we really want to be asking better questions and really understanding what we're doing and why we're doing it otherwise we're just going to follow things blindly and not really get anywhere meaningful so in this video we're going to be looking at the meaning of different types of muscle muscle tension and three general approaches you can use based on your needs and these three are ones that you've probably not heard of two in particular you've probably never heard of so in the simplest terms a lot of the pain we experience, you know, day-to-day -day pain, is the result of persistent muscular tension. Now, Phil Greenfield, who I've mentioned before on the podcast, great resort, great guy, great book. He has a great term for this, and he calls it PEMTOR. I think he coined the term, but uh, I give him credit anyway. Uh, and it's an abbreviation of persistent elevated muscular tension while at rest. So PEMTOR. So it's essentially the inability to relax muscles when we don't need them to be tense. So if you sit down, if you lie down, if you go to bed, you know, not being able to relax those muscles is what we would call PEMTOR, according to Phil. Um, and as I've covered in numerous videos and blog posts in the past, pain is ultimately an output of the brain. You know, so if we want to address the root cause of muscular tension and pain, we need to understand the brain's motivations because the brain gives the orders. It tells everything what to do. Uh, and by the brain, I mean the brain and nervous system, the nerves that extend out and permeate the entire body. They give the orders and then the muscles, they simply follow these orders. You know, so with this in mind, it should come as no surprise that aggressive foam rolling and forcing our muscles to lengthen you know, through static stretching isn't going to work unless we also address why the brain has chosen persistent muscular tension as a useful strategy. So your brain is creating this tension because it has some sort of purpose and you're just going to take that away by smashing your muscle with a foam roller, uh, which is a bad idea, which is why it doesn't stick. You see, most of the techniques, videos and resources, they talk about what to do. As I've said, they tell you foam roll this, foam roll that, you know, dig a, dig a golf ball into here and it, you'll release it, you know, release this muscle for this benefit. But they don't tell you why you would want to do that or the you know the reasons why are very surface level it's like oh this is sore therefore release it rather than think well why why is it tense to begin with you know we need to ask these questions because our body is very 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 smart and it has very good reasons to do things they may not seem rational to us but they are very good reasons so we need to know why we would choose one option over the other why we might foam roll one time and not foam roll another or all that sort of stuff we need to be able to navigate the world effectively otherwise it's just it's just a mess of stuff there's so much information and unless you know how to think and how to navigate through it then you're just at the at the at the mercy of whoever is giving you advice so let's talk a bit about the brain and its motivations why would your brain maintain muscular tension when you're at rest and what purpose does this serve so your brain is primarily concerned with survival and it's, it's, like I said, it's tremendously smart. It's very perceptive. 
but it can also be overprotective. So the analogy I use a lot is your brain is like an overprotective parent. You know, you need to work with it rather than force it. You need to convince it. So rather than forcing things to change, we need to convince it with compelling evidence that the muscular tension is no longer warranted. So the brain, the overprotective parent, has created muscular tension to protect you from something, usually to stabilize an area. And we need to convince it with compelling evidence that that is no longer necessary. So with this in mind, let's talk about three general approaches you can use and how they fit into this brain-based approach to muscular tension. So the first is muscular tension due to instability in a joint. So the next time you feel tension in a muscle, before you decide to tenderize it into submission with a foam roller, you might ask yourself if this might serve a purpose. So what if your body, in its infinite wisdom, has created a support structure through this tense muscle? You know, you know that infinite wisdom that you trust to tell you when to sleep, when to eat, and that you trust to keep you breathing while you sleep and to keep digesting food while you go about your day and to heal wounds and, and damage in the body and to constantly be self-regulating. That, that wisdom, you know, that infinite wisdom that you take for granted and wouldn't otherwise question for a second. Why is this any different? Why do we question muscular tension? Why do we say, well, you know, that's, that's obviously an error. That's a glitch. You know, I need to undo that. Why do we not trust the body's wisdom in this instant instance? So why not pause for a second and ponder if this sensation of tension is part of a useful strategy to cope, to cope with some sort of problem. So in instances like this, it's often worth considering whether or not a muscle might be working harder and remaining tense in order to stabilize a joint because another muscle in the chain lacks the strength or coordination to do its job. So a common example of this is hamstring tension and pain due to a lack of strength or coordination of the glute mus muscles. Excuse me. Both are needed for walking, so your glutes and your hamstrings, both are needed for walking, but if one isn't pulling its weight, it's not you know, contributing enough, then the other has to work harder. And this can happen with a number of related muscles that work together. So it's not, it's not just two muscles. It's usually a, you know, a series of muscles working together and one of them maybe isn't doing enough and others are doing too much or whatever it is. So a diagram I use a lot to illustrate this is where you see that the various muscles, I'll show you the, the diagram here, the various muscles contribute a certain percentage of their effort to the overall effort of controlling a series of joints. But when one muscle isn't pulling its weight, others have to pick up the slack, potentially leading to excessive muscular tension and pain. So the example I use here in this diagram is that we have our calves, we have our hamstrings, we have our glutes, we have our quads, and they're all, say, ideally, hypothetically contributing 25% of the overall effort. But say the calf is only offering 5%, hamstrings only 5%, quads only 20% then the glute has to take the brunt of it or vice versa or whatever combination of the two. The point is you end up with <clears throat> perhaps a muscle that is doing too little or doing too much and that's leading to pain. And so just to paint another analogy for this, if you do a thousand bicep curls on your left arm, but you only do 10 on your right arm, which is more likely to hurt? Obviously the one that's doing more work, the left one, it's, it's, it's going to be more sore because it's doing more. And it's also possible that the hamstring is sore you know, because it's weak and the pain is a result of it being unable to keep up with the demands that you're placing on it. So it's important to understand when, when we talk about this that the sensation of tension is simply a sensation. It doesn't automatically tell us whether or not a muscle is in a shortened or lengthened position. You know, so, so we shouldn't use muscle tension as a reason for lengthening and releasing a muscle because that's usually what, what we assume straight away. Something feels tight or we feel tension, we assume, well, it must be in this short and contracted position. But maybe it's a long and tight and lengthening it and stretching it and foam rolling it further isn't going to help. So we shouldn't blindly 
just follow that tension as, as a signal for a need for release of the muscle. So with this in mind, you may ask yourself what other muscles in the chain or the surrounding area might not be pulling their weight. So do you have a voluntary con connection to all of the re re relevant muscles? Excuse me. So going back to, this would be a common example for back pain is people tend to have a, a lack of a connection to their glutes. So you should have a voluntary connection to most of your muscles, most of your, not every single one of your muscles, some of your muscles work unconsciously, but the major ones like your glutes, your hamstrings, you should be able to contract those on demand and you should be able to relax them on demand. So can you contract these muscles on demand? You can stand up, you can sit, uh, stand up in a comfortable position and can you contract your glutes? Can you contract your hamstrings? Can you direct you know, that contraction to specific areas and can you then relax them on demand? Can you control the joint? Can you, so if, if we're talking about the glutes, the hamstrings, can you control the hip? Can you control the low back? Can you control the knee? Can you move it precisely and in, in a controlled manner? And an exercise you can try to understand this concept is to grab a tennis ball or any anything that you can grip in your hand. And so I'm going to use the example of a tennis ball. Um, what you want to do is you want to squeeze the tennis ball at a 10% effort. And then what I, what I want you to do is to increase your effort in regular increments. So for example, you would squeeze at 10%, then 30%, 50% and so on. And the more increments you can control, the more you have control of that muscle. And the aim is to be able to modulate up and down and create tension and relaxation on demand. So ideally, the healthiest muscle is one that you can connect to and you can, you know, do 1% effort, 2%, 5 you know, and you can do it in all, all these individual increments. Now, that's quite unrealistic. But to be able to do say like a 10% contraction, 20, 30, 40, 50, and so on, that's something that you could realistically aim for and that you'd want to have. And so <clears throat> if you are in pain and if an area is sore and is tense, assess this, can you control that area on demand? Can you tighten it up? Can you relax it? Can you tight it, tighten it up in specific increments and relax it partially and so on? And if you can't, then that's going to tell you a lot that you're lacking control of that area. So, um, like I said, you could try this with a specific body part that feels sore or tight and see if you have the same control there. So try it with your hand, try it with squeezing a tennis ball and then go to the area that's sore and see, do you have that control? With this, you need to be really mindful and you need to contract slowly. So you need to increase that tension relax that tension. And then I want you to simply alternate between contracting and relaxing. And you have to be honest with yourself and try to minimize tension elsewhere in the body. So usually when you have a lack of awareness of an area, you will compensate very well and very subtly and you'll create tension elsewhere. So just, just be honest with yourself. People don't like the reality that they might not be that strong in a specific area and they might just tense to make themselves feel like they can do it, like they're strong. So just be honest with yourself. No one's watching, no one's judging you. And it's not really a measure of your strength. It's a measure of coordination and neural connection. So it's, it's not a judgment on you as a person. Um, but yeah, sit in a comfortable position, seated, lying down, whatever it is, and see, can you connect to those muscles? I find the glutes are really useful because it's very common for people to lack that voluntary connection to the glutes and see, can you do that? What about your hamstrings? What about your calves? Your low back muscles, can you wind them up? Can you relax them? And so on. Then if you feel a lack of control in an area or a lack of connection to the area, you may want to work on the mobility and the strength of the related joints and muscles rather than on simply stretching and releasing things to no avail. And as you build strength in all of the relevant muscles and create control of the joint, the muscular tension, the muscular tension should release on its own now that the brain feels safe 
and is convinced essentially that you have adequate strength to support the joint. So by strengthening the area, you've communicated with the brain that, look, I have this strength now, I can do this. So it's like first, you know, trying to squat 200 kilos without any preparation, without any training, and your brain's gonna not be happy with that. You might injure yourself. So you build up that strength. And the problem is we, we tend to, because we don't move much throughout our day, because we have all sorts of compensations, we lose connection and lose control of certain areas. And that maybe becomes a, an issue and it manifests as muscular tension. So think about it that way. Think about building strength. Think about building mobility and building control of these joints. And that muscular tension should relax because the healthy muscle is one that's at ease, it's soft and supple. And it's able to increase tension and it's able to reduce tension on demand. It's not a muscle that's constantly tight and it's not a muscle that's constantly relaxed but without a connection. It's somewhere right in the middle and it has it has access to all of those ranges. So now the next thing I'd like you to consider is muscular tension due to frustration. So this considers more of the mental and psychological side of things and you might ask yourself how frustrated you get on a daily basis and if you're living at odds with your beliefs or your passions. Are you thinking one thing but having to say another and is that, you know, is that happening frequently in your day-to-day -day life? And, you know, perhaps this muscular tension, it simply builds up without ever being relieved. You know, the, these things add up, They're, they tend to be small, but it adds up over time and you add in other factors, stress and all that sort of stuff, and it adds up. So if something in your life is leading to constant frustration and internalization of your emotions, no amount of foam rolling is going to resolve the issues. Now you can get foam rolling techniques and manual therapy techniques that seem to help release or draw out negative emotions or even positive emotions. Um, but that's not necessarily something you want to just kind of stumble upon without really expecting it because it can be quite, uh, quite uh, intense. So, and, and really that's, you know, the foam rolling isn't, isn't the, the solution really. It's just eliciting the, the underlying issue. So you want to look at what is it in your life that maybe is at odds with, with your beliefs. So uh, we think about this as incongruence. So what you believe and what you do and, and no, what you believe and then what you do are don't match up exactly. And that leads to tension. So this type of frustration that's internalized can be caused by interactions you have and can be somewhat driven by your natural tendencies and your personality. So you might ask yourself, do you have a tendency to internalize your frustrations? Are you good at just staying quiet, at biting your tongue, whatever way you want to think about it? Are you really good at that? And of course, we all deal with this to a certain degree. You know, sometimes we have to keep things to ourselves because it would be inappropriate to voice our opinion at that time. And a certain amount of this, uh, of this is part of our everyday life. But what I'd like you to consider is, is it a significant part of your life? And really, are you living at odds with what you believe? Are you in a relationship that's not working? Do you have friends who aren't right for you? Uh, you know, what is your situation socially and psychologically in, in work? that might be creating internalized tension. And it doesn't even have to be anything particularly sinister or some deep-seated trauma. It could just be that repeatedly over time, you're constantly having to just hold something back and it just builds up and builds up and you don't have an outlet. So as a solution to this, what I'd encourage you to do is to write out a list of situations you've experienced and tendencies you have towards internalizing frustration, and then answer a few questions about each of these. So I've included a writing therapy template in the resources section, but essentially it will ask you to outline everything to do with this experience, to do with these tendencies, your thoughts, your beliefs, um, everything surrounding it, whether positive or negative, and then you're going to explore how much of an effect that has 
uh, that has had on you? Has it changed the way you look at the world? Has it changed the way you approach things? Has it changed your view of yourself? Has it, um, and yeah, has what effect has it had on you? And it's just going to kind of challenge you a bit to, to dig a bit into that and see for yourself what, what effect these beliefs have on you and what, where they come from. So uh, you may also consider keeping a daily journal to vent and voice your concerns or simply sort through your thoughts. And this is, again, like I said, it doesn't have to be some major traumatic event. It can just be little things like you hate your job. You know, I know what that's like. I used to have a, a job I hated and it's just you sort of have to do it and you sort of have to get get by and you know it's not forever but you know it adds up and so you don't necessarily have to dig deep into you know the you know internalized trauma of that where that that's rooted because it's probably not rooted anywhere but things like a journal every day at the end of the day or at the start of the day just put it all out on paper voice your frustrations say whatever you want to say and just let it go. You can sort of think about it in a, in a symbolic way. You're just ridding your body of that. And, and you can get into some embodiment practices that allow you to sort of symbolically get rid of that tension or let it go or shake it off. Or some people talk about, you know, showering yourself, and getting rid of, of uh, those tendencies and getting rid of that tension. So whatever way works for you. So, um, it's also worth making sure that you have a support structure. Yeah, this is the next thing, uh, because it's one thing to to you know start documenting this, expressing yourself and that, but we ideally want to resolve the issue and then not have it happen again. So you might see: Do you have a support structure in place? You know, do you have friends and family that you can talk to about the things that concern you? And so you might pause for a second to consider what support structures you have and what physical, emotional and mental outlets you have in life. And again, that can be simply a friend you meet for coffee to just vent and they don't, you're not asking them to solve your problems. You're not asking them for anything and you can be upfront with them. You can say, look, I'm not looking for you to, to solve this for me. I just need someone to, to listen to me for 20 minutes and let me vent and you know people do that all the time you know everyone voices their grievances and we're not trying to fix one another we're just letting it all out and there's value in that and just being able to let it out so the writing is a great way to do that in a controlled setting on your own maybe you don't have someone you can speak to and if you don't then i would say you know you should look into that uh, see what you can do to to create that real support structure but writing is a very useful way and, and sometimes there might be things that you just don't feel comfortable saying even to your closest friends or to your family and so writing it or even saying it to an empty room is going to be useful um, and then physical outlets um, martial arts um, yoga whatever any kind of movement going out into the woods and just walking and just breathing and just feeling like you have a break from the stresses of life and then um, artistic pursuits anything like that, that involves self-expression through music, through composition, through art, whatever it is, these are tremendously valuable and they shouldn't be underestimated. And this is something I've been exploring again recently. I used to be very much into music, playing guitar, play lots of instruments, write music, and I just sort of stopped because, you know, you grow up and you've got more important things to do, but you forget the value of simply being creative, of simply just noodling on the guitar and, and what that offers you, whether you're good or not. It's not about that. It's just about, I don't know what it is exactly, to be honest. I will do a video on this as I research it more, but there's something of value, something tangible that comes from self-expression and creativity. So think about that. Are there things that you're neglecting? You maybe you haven't been playing your guitar or practicing your piano or violin or drawing anymore. Maybe you're not painting, maybe you're not crafting things designing clothes, designing, I, I love, I used to want to be an architect and I draw blueprints all the time. I draw blueprints of, you know, say I won, <laughs> say I won the Euro Millions and I built a house. I, I draw a blueprint of that and that's just something, something you might want to try. Um, okay, so 
in some cases, this tendency towards internalization is driven by a state of internal stress. So simply put, you internalize things and overreact because your body is in a state of chronic stress. And when this is the underlying condition of your body, a lot of the traditional methods don't work because you need to address the body's internal environment as a priority. This is, but this is because what's going on inside your body, and this is in terms of your physiology and your hormones and all the chemical, the chemical environment inside your body, uh, it has a direct effect on your ability to think clearly and to evaluate information objectively. So when our body is stressed, it becomes harder to manage our emotions and we're more likely to react spontaneously and negatively. And this is something that isn't really talked about a lot, but a lot of why we can, we can act in, against our best interests and why we don't stick to things and why we don't change in spite of having the resources and all the information to change is because our body doesn't have the energy to take on something new um, and this is a, a big topic that I'll go into more detail in another, uh, in another episode. So uh, this is relevant to muscle tension, you know, bringing this back to, to muscle tension without getting too much into uh, other tangents. This is relevant to muscle tension because this state of internal stress also affects the ability of our muscles to relax because it actually requires energy to relax muscles, which may seem counterintuitive but it's because muscles are <clears throat> muscles are constantly contracting you know they're never off you know we, we talk about muscles being switched on or activated or switched off and or sleepy and that, that that's not it's just not true uh, unless you have you know a severed nerve and there's no actual connection to that muscle but muscles are they're constantly contracting at varying rates in relation to other muscles so say two opposing muscles here say my bicep here and my tricep here um, one might be contracting and if it's contracting then the other one has to lengthen to a certain extent to accommodate that movement and vice versa so there's constantly this sort of mild tug of war between the two and while a muscle is relaxed it's still maintaining a low level of activity it's still humming and balancing this more contracted muscle. But it's not off, it's not relaxed, uh, so to speak, though we think of it as relaxed. It's simply in a more lengthened and less active um, state. So this ability to alternate between shortening and lengthening actually requires more energy than to simply keep a muscle relaxed. Um, and this is why, why we have an issue because people will have you know, a general tendency towards muscle cramps and tension because they don't have adequate energy to maintain that balance of muscles humming back and forth and balancing one another. Uh, because like I said, it takes energy to relax. So is this relevant to you? That would be the next question. And you'll have a clue that this is relevant to you if you have a general tendency towards muscle cramps and tension. And if this is a driving factor behind your muscle tension issues, it's unlikely that it's going to be solely in one area. <clears throat> so this isn't going to be like, oh, I always get a tight shoulder. It's going to be, I am generally tight. I generally feel muscle tension. I'm generally stiff and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, that, that's going to be a way to, to evaluate whether or not this is relevant to you. So like I said, if it's just one area that's always tight, then it's unlikely that this is really the driving factor. But if you have a tendency to towards tension, uh, then this is likely what you need to look at. You need to look at your body's ability to uh, create energy because it's not an muscle tension isn't really a local. It's not really a, a local issue. It's a global issue in your body and it's an inability to use energy properly, leading to widespread muscle tension. So other symptoms, other peripheral symptoms that you can look for that are going to seem unrelated to muscular tension, but that will give you an indication that energy, proper energy usage is a driving factor behind your muscular tension. 
Those symptoms are <clears throat> obviously the general tendency towards muscle cramping, but then also low body temperature, so cold hands and or feet. Some people don't notice this, so you may need to actually monitor your body temperature with a thermometer. Um, and this is, this is sort of dependent on the individual, but if you're generally below a 36.5 degrees Celsius, consistently then that's going to be a good indication now there are exceptions to the rule and there are other factors to consider but that that could be enough of an indication that you want to um, analyze this and, and monitor it so you get a digital thermometer and monitor your temperature say anytime you feel muscular tension and see are you consistently under 36.5 degrees celsius i'm not sure what that is in fahrenheit uh, that you can convert it um, on Google or something. So low body temperature, you might not notice it. You might need to actually measure it um, because you might just be used to it. And that used to be the case for me. I was just used to being cold. And so I didn't, and I sort of had a certain amount of pride in being comfortable with being cold. Um, so there can be that as well. But my body was too cold and I, was, I constantly had muscle cramps. And my body was basically just unhealthy internally. Um, so other symptoms are general digestive or sleep issues. Um, as well as mental and emotional health issues. So th these can just be like a tendency towards anxiety, a tendency towards depression. It doesn't have to be anything major, just other peripheral things that seem unrelated, but that are giving you a, a snapshot of what your body is like internally. And so if your body is like that internally, then there is a certain level of stress that is preventing your body from relaxing muscles properly. So um, other things you can consider are if you exercise intensely, and this is really popular at the moment, high intensity interval training, people do crazy workouts and you know, they're, they're, you know, they're muscling through all sorts of crazy workouts and they think they're healthy and they feel the adrenaline, but it's, it's really taking a toll on, on their body and, and they will realize that eventually. Uh, and then things like dieting and fasting regularly because uh, and then a general tendency towards stress if you tend to be anxious tend to be stressed or have a high stress job then these are all going to be factors so <clears throat> all of these things uh, highly um, intense exercise dieting and fasting all are a concern because they increase the production of stress hormones in your body and the more your body is running on stress hormones the more it's um, having to compromise how it uses energy and so over time it loses the ability to use energy properly and so it, it it becomes very good at running on stress hormones but not very good on at running on uh, glycogen and sugar which leads to issues then and the inability to relax muscles efficiently so that's a, a rabbit hole in and of itself and i can't i can't actually give you specific recommendations when it gets to that level all we can do at this stage is to sort of look broadly at your health and what stresses you're under. So the simplest approach I use, and I'll, I'll show you a graphic for this, is to visualize a stress stress and health scale. So, and you want to get a sense of where the stress bucket is overflowing and what additional things you can do to fill up the health bucket. So in this diagram, you can see on the left, we have our stress bucket and that's filled with things that are stressful demands on our life and on the right we have our health bucket and that is full of things that improve our health and give our body a chance to recover and heal and we want to see are the scales tipped towards stress or towards health and, and if you are in pain and if you have persistent muscular tension while at rest then it's likely that you're tipped towards stress and we want to address that by very generally seeing can we reduce what is in the stress bucket can we take things out that we know are bad for us and or preferably a combination of the two then add things into the health bucket to balance things out because the body once it has the resources will tend to self-regulate and and resolve whatever issues are there so we don't need to necessarily go down this big rabbit hole of your physiology and how to manipulate it in a, in a precise manner. We can just provide maybe better resources and the body will take care of itself. 
though in some cases it can be so severe that you need to you need to work with a professional who can advise you and give you all the all these specifics and you may need to work with a doctor and that's sort of an inconvenient truth but uh, if you're interested in real solutions then that's where we need to go uh, and that's personally where i had to go so um, i'd be happy to guide you through that that process so like i said beyond this kind of stress bucket health bucket it's far too individual to um to offer specific advice um, but i've included some resources that you can look into and so i have a video that goes into this in more detail and then lots of resources that you can you can look into you can inform yourself and you can act more in in accordance with with your needs so if you suspect this is relevant to you you can get in touch and we can have a chat or you can have a look at the resources that will help you resolve this issue don't hesitate to get in touch talk to me i'll point you in the right direction because i know I, I refer a lot of people out to experts in this you know uh, endocrinologists people who know hormones inside out and can advise you with hormones in mind because most nutritional advice isn't isn't based on hormonal health or stress reduction it's based on physique and fitness and those are sometimes at odds with stress reduction and overall health so don't hesitate to get in touch and i will point you in the right direction so that's it for this video and um, like i said there are resources in a document and then you can expand on these three strategies that we covered so we talked about muscular tension because of um essentially a lack of mobility a lack of strength in a muscle so the muscle muscle is tense and it's bracing because it lacks coordination it lacks strength so we need to look at mobility training and um in the resources section i have a joint by joint list of uh, video playlists that will go through assessments of the joint see is the joint healthy where is it restricted and then some self-assessments and some simple mobility techniques that you can try and then the second strategy was uh, writing therapy and general self-expression having outlets having support structures where you can essentially vent and not constantly internalize tension and internalize frustrations so the writing template will guide you through the writing exercise and i would encourage you to uh, answer the questions and ass assess whether you whether or not you have support structures and whether or not you are living generally at odds with your beliefs are you having to remain tight-lipped when there's a political debate in work or you know talking about contentious issues and you just need to kind of go with the crowd and maybe that's leading to fr frustration or maybe you're in a job you hate and maybe you need to find a new job or you need to find better ways of balancing the challenges of working a job that you really don't like um and then finally the internal physio physiological side of things like i said your body loses the ability to use energy properly and so we're, we require energy to relax muscles and so no amount of stretching no amount of releasing is going to solve that as long as the internal chemistry is making us prone to poor energy usage so we need to address this very generally through stress reduction things like breathing general stress reducing things meditation enough sleep enough food uh, you know physical outlets emotional outlets all that sort of stuff and then you may need to go deeper into the nutrition side of things and work with someone who can advise you uh, based on your individual needs and i have then resources on that other videos that go into this and people you can contact if you want more information so thanks for watching um i hope i hope this new format of, of reading and ad-libbing a bit kept this a bit more structured uh that was 40 minutes still long enough um but yeah let me know what you think let me know for now i'm going to keep this this format because I, I it just i think it makes a lot of sense um so thanks again for watching and have a great day